Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hi, and welcome to the New Warehouse Podcast. I am your host, Kevin Lawton, and it is now 2020. So happy new year to all of the listeners out there and happy new year to all you guys. Uh, so I wanted to do a little year end recap for 2019, uh, the first year of the podcast ever. Uh, it was an exciting year, definitely. Uh, I started this thing and I really didn't know, I guess, what to expect. I kind of started this looking uh, looking for something similar to this and there was nothing out there like this. So I decided to do it myself. So now I'm doing it. and. Um, I can't believe the reception that it's got over the past year. Uh, it's pretty amazing. It's hard to believe at times uh, how many listeners there actually are out there. Um, but I appreciate all of you, and I hope that you guys have a great 2020. Uh, so I wanted to take a quick look at this week, uh, look at a couple clips from some of my favorite parts of the past year, and then talk a little bit about how I think they affected the year and also how I think these things are going to have an impact uh, in the future as well. Uh, so for the first clip, uh, of course, I had to pick the first episode ever, uh, which I did with Bruce Welty. And uh, this actually was pretty interesting because I didn't realize actually how connected I think at the time Bruce is to the industry. And as I started to do more interviews throughout the year, I started to realize just how connected he was and he's connected through Locus and then Locus is connected through this. Um, so it's pretty interesting to find out um, as I progress through this podcast, uh, the first guest ever had all these connections to future guests and things of that nature. Uh, I actually got him on the show just by reaching out uh, on LinkedIn. I was thinking what's, what's going to be an interesting first episode to talk about what's interesting and Somehow Bruce popped up in my LinkedIn feed uh, through a mutual connection and I saw robots and I said, oh, robots, that that must be pretty cool. We could talk about that. Um, and of course, throughout the year, uh, I've talked to multiple robotics companies, visited uh, Vecna, visited Locus, um, and then a pro man, of course, robots were everywhere. Um, so it was definitely an interesting discussion. Um, and probably my favorite part of the discussion was um, his story on how Amazon ended up acquiring Kiva and how he, he actually had Kiva at his operation prior and then Amazon kind of shut them out. So let's take a listen to uh, that clip right now and then we'll talk a little more after that. Amazon came, came for a tour of our building Kiva as uh, their host and we opened the doors for them, put out the red carpet kind of exciting to have you know amazon there definitely yeah what we didn't realize then was that amazon was interested in acquiring kiva not not just acquiring the robots but acquiring the whole company the entire so, company yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah they did that and uh 16 months later they told us we couldn't buy any more robots from kiva or which now i think they named it amazon robotics oh wow so then uh that put us in a box and we decided, well, you know, we know how robots work. We know how warehouses work. We know how all these systems work. Why don't we just build our own robot? So we set about doing that, and we created a company called Locus Robotics. So really interesting to hear about how that happened, and I think it's pretty telling, uh, especially as, and of course, when this happened was uh, multiple years ago at this time now. 
um, but very telling how much of a driving force Amazon is. Um, and I think it will be interesting to see just how Amazon goes about those things in the coming year, uh, the com- in the years after that, and how Amazon uh, will continue to grow. And with so many different startups coming into our industry as well, it would be interesting to see how those acquisitions might happen because Amazon tends to, just like Kiva, they like to buy something and then not share it anymore. Um, So it would be really interesting. But I think what's also interesting about that is you actually see how other innovation happened uh, through Amazon taking that action. So Bruce went and with the co-founders and founded Locus Robotics, uh, which is a really, really innovative company. And I think Locus Robotics is... One of, I think, the most impressive robotics um, that I've seen, especially interacting with it at Promat and then interacting at their site as well. Um, it's incredibly easy to use. Um, and, of course, they're going to be uh, in this episode a little later, too. Um, so the second clip that I wanted to touch on was something that actually really, really blew my mind, I would say. So I went to Promat shortly after I started this podcast this year. And... It was kind of a uh, it was kind of a rush to be honest. Uh, I started the podcast in the beginning of March, and uh, Promat was in April, so it's kind of a scramble to figure this whole thing out. And how was I gonna go to Promat? And it was kind of going on a whim. And I reached out to uh, MHI, and they helped me out. They got me a press pass and everything, and uh, so it was very cool. So it was really exciting. And so I went, ended up going, doing like 40 interviews in three days. Um, so it was it was pretty exhausting, uh, to say the least. Um, but I got some really great content, and I learned a lot of things too as well. And by far, I mean, there was robots, robots, automation everywhere that you could imagine. Um, but one thing that really stood out to me and blew me away uh, was the Enersys booth and how Enersys was actually starting a wireless charging solution for forklifts, um, which I think is pretty, pretty amazing. And it's pretty incredible when you think about forklifts and how they charge now and how batteries work, um, and taking wireless charging, like something that you do with your cell phone now, um, and applying that on a big scale to forklifts, I think is really, really innovative. Um, and actually was able to speak to, well, first I spoke to Harold uh, Van Ness at uh, Promat itself, where he kind of introduced the idea to me and discussed it a little bit, and then um, and that's in episode 7. Um, but then later on in the year, in episode 18, I actually talked to uh, Jorn Tinnemeyer um, from Enersys as well, a little further about that. So, so right now we're going to play the clip uh, from episode 7 from Promat uh, with Harold, and he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, just exactly what the wireless charging concept is and a little bit about how it'll work. Other thing we showed was our wireless charger uh, concept. So we'll be launching that about this time next year. Yeah, inductive charging or wireless charging. And, you know, if you have an electric toothbrush, you're using the same thing. Um, I have an induction cooktop at home. Uh, My wife picked it out. It's phenomenal. We've had it for seven or eight years. But it's, again, it's electromagnetism, right? It's inducing a... uh, cooktops, uh, I'm exciting the electrons electromagnetically. In, in this, what we're doing is you'll, in, in this is I'm realizing I'm pointing with my hands and this is a, an audience that can't see that. <laughs> it's okay. We're going to grab some photos. Oh, cool. cool photos. So, uh, inductive charging or wireless charging, you have a transmitting coil and a receiving coil. And the transmitting coil is buried into the floor of your parking area at the distribution okay. center. Or maybe we put a bunch of them down an aisle. We call it a hot aisle yeah. so that you're driving down and dynamically charging that vehicle. So as you're moving, you're charging. Yes. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Now, that'll be our second generation of the product. Yeah. Um, but the first generation will probably be parking areas, either outside of a break room or where that vehicle is typically parked. But we're going to yeah. model that. Where are you, where are you going to be most likely? Yeah. Put the vehicle there. You park it. No connections to make. There's a receiving coil on the truck or, or in our lithium battery that will inductively pass the current through, pass the charge through. We can charge at a higher rate because we're not limited by the connectors anymore. And um, again, it's one of those, you just go in, you park the thing, and from a usability perspective, yeah. it just happens. In opportunity and fast charge, one of the top failure modes or reasons why they don't work is operators forget to plug in. Yeah. yeah, it's a pain point. Yeah. This gets rid of that. Again, it's an ease of use thing, right? Yeah. 
And again, our Nexus Ion and our, our Nexus Pure batteries, our Lithium Ion and our TPBL product, they like, especially with advanced carbon in our, on our thin plate pure lead, they love to be opportunity charged. They just yeah. thrive on that. So let's take advantage of it. So that, you know, and, and people really, I think, are, have been excited and receptive to the, the, the uh, two technologies we're offering our ion, Lithium Ion and our thin plate pure lead product. They've been excited about the common features that you can have with a charger and, and the way we model stuff. But it's like kids at Christmas when they see wireless charging. Yeah. It's probably been the highlight of our booth. That was exciting when I heard that. I, yeah, it's, I will it's admit, really yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah, very cool. So very cool indeed. Uh, I'm, I'm still actually really excited about wireless charging uh, when I need to hear that again, um, and I think of the possibilities of it. Uh, I think it's pretty incredible. And you know, you heard there where he said one of the biggest problems they have at operations is that the operator forgets to plug in the forklift right and you know it seems like a simple thing but that can be a huge deal because if you forget to plug it in say overnight say you don't run a 24-hour operation say you forget to plug it in overnight the next day i mean you're kind of you're kind of dead for a little bit and you lose a lot of productivity there so kind of mistake proofing that through the wireless charging is is a huge deal so i'm really excited to see it in action for real um, in an operation, so you know, if you're lucky enough to have a wireless charging operation, please invite me to your uh, warehouse. <laughs> so, I'll uh, definitely be checking in with Enersys at uh, Modex 2020 as well, upcoming in March. Um, and if you guys have not heard or seen um, when I've discussed on social media or through um, the email list at all, uh, the new warehouse will actually have a studio right on the floor of modex 2020 so we will be in there in the thick of it with all the exhibitors uh, we'll be interviewing people live uh, right there from the show floor um, so if you are interested as well as being uh, interviewed and you're going to be at modex and you want to stop by um, you can head to the newwarehouse.com and all the information will be there you can email me too, kevin at the new warehouse.com um, we can set up a time for you to get interviewed i'll be there every single day interviewing all day long um, it should be a lot of fun. Um, so with wireless charging, I mean, it's definitely a game changer to me, and I hope you think the same. Um, but another game changer that I came across this year, um, actually in two different episodes, uh, is really interesting, I think, when we look at the hardware side of things. And this is talking about utilizing a subscription-based model. Um, so when I first got introduced to the idea, obviously familiar with subscription based model, but never in the case of hardware itself, um, especially for, um, the warehousing distribution space. So when we first came across, it was in episode 25, uh, when we talked to Gabe Griffoni, uh, who is the CEO of Rufus Labs. Um, so basically they have a subscription model for their hardware devices, which are wearable devices for picking. Um, so we're going to listen to the clip where Gabe describes how the subscription model works and um, also a little bit about why I think it is a game changer. So check it out. Our platform is very fluid. It kind of grows with you and grows with technology. So you'll always have the latest technology. Uh, we operate on a subscription model. So yeah, I, I think a lot that. of customers like, <laughs> yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> uh, we're... we're <laughs> We get a lot of feedback from customers in the space, you know, inventory managers who, who do this and, and supply chain. Um, you're used to spending three to five thousand dollars to buy a piece of hardware mm -hmm. that you're hoping to keep for five to seven years, um, and you know, then you're going to put warranties on top of that too. It, it's expensive uh, to be able to to be able to keep up with the times and have new hardware. Technology is changing so quickly. Five to seven years is is a long time to keep tech. I mean, in you know, a decade ago, the iPhone had just come out, you know, a year or two before, and yeah. look at what's changed in a decade. So in five to seven years, or even seven to 10, if people use this stuff, it's just, it's not the way, hardware is, is a commodity now. So mm -hmm. the stuff that we provide is very unique and very rugged, but we can consistently make it better. And part of our platform is, you know, in two to three years, when we've got newer versions of hardware, you're just going to get that and we'll we'll take back the old hardware and that'll bring all new sorts of benefits with it as well so yeah, definitely. that's how our yeah that's that's how the model works it's an operational expense instead of you know three four or five thousand dollars up front for hardware um you know you're spending under a hundred dollars uh, on a worker uh and you're getting not just hardware to outfit them uh but we also provide 
I guess I can break it down to three areas. Does that make the most sense to talk about the three areas that kind of come with our, our offering? Yeah, yeah. Let me just touch on the uh, the hardware part, though, real quick, because you yeah. know, in the beginning of the show, I was talking about the flexibility, and that's the flexibility that I'm really excited the most about, I guess, personally. Um, but, you know, because just yeah. like you said, from personal experience, you know, it's expensive to outright buy one piece of hardware, right? So, you know, I know from my experience, it's like, and, you know, my experience is kind of in starting up new distribution centers. So you need to kind of equip the workers and stuff. And, you know, you have an initial plan of like, I think I need this many handheld devices. And then, uh, you know, you end up needing maybe like a couple more. And then it becomes a big thing and a whole approval process because it's all this investment and money. And the flexibility of the subscription model that you guys provide is like, I think it's amazing because it allows you to kind of have more uh, flex. We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Stability with the amount of workers that you have and the amount of handheld devices you have to work with. And, you know, when you invest in buying one then if that one breaks then you have to invest in buying like a backup one too sometimes and you know that can be another costly expense and i think you know when we had talked previously to this you know i think you mentioned that if you have one that breaks you guys will just swap it out correct yeah so um you're, you're spot on all those things and you know we've spent the last you know three years in so many warehouses listening to um you know Everyone from, you know, we're spending time on the floor with pickers, uh, you know, people in every position kind of understanding what are the pain points and what are the best areas. So mm-hmm. the reason we kind of put the platform together the way we, we did kind of addresses everything you just talked about. Yeah. So aside from the subscription model, I mean, I think the subscription model is really, really great. Um, also, the subscription model, we were introduced to that with Locus as well as they have the robots as a service business model, meaning that the robots are basically subscription based. Um, You pay for the robots that you have for the time you need them. Uh, And we'll actually go into a clip of that talking about peak season and how they have these surge bots that come in and out, um, which I think is really, really interesting. I think that what's interesting though from the Rufus Labs case is that Rufus Labs is more of like a startup, just uh, a few years old now. Uh, I forget exactly how many, but if you look at them, they're doing something that other companies have been doing for a long time, right? They're providing this hardware device for picking. Um, there's this a wearable, um, but, you know, wearable, handheld gun, uh, ring scanner, voice, whatever the case may be, you have this hardware piece. Um, so I think that as you look at it as a startup coming in and they're providing this new model to the industry, it'll be interesting to see how that gains traction and i think it will because if you look at it like we talked about in the clip that the expense there is so much i mean one device can be a couple thousand dollars and that's that's a big investment and to need just one more to have a backup one just sitting or something like that um that can be a big investment especially for a smaller company as well just starting out so the subscription model really works a lot better and gives you a lot more flexibility. So it would be interesting to see if some of the older companies in that space start to adopt that model in some way as well. Um, so it would be interesting to see how that plays out in the future. Um, so I also wanted to talk, too, about... Uh, so we had so much discussion this year and at Promat and everything about automation and robotics and i have to say actually at some point during this year 
I think I had talked to so many robotics companies. I was like, am I doing a robotics podcast or like distribution logistics podcast? Um, so, which is, uh, you know, no, no slight to any robotics company um, that I interviewed or anything like that. But I wanted to get a little more um, insight from other aspects of the industry as well. Um, but robotics is just growing so much and becoming so prevalent because it's becoming such a, such a big deal. Um, so I connected with Raymond Corporation, and Raymond Corporation actually is a forklift company, if you're not familiar, but Raymond Corporation actually is going by this philosophy, and they do have automation as well um, in their portfolio, but uh, they're going by this philosophy of optimization before automation. Um, so in the next next clip, we're actually going to talk to the CEO of Raymond, uh, who is Mike Field, and he's going to tell us a little bit about how they approach the optimization before automation. And I think it's really important because with all the automation and robotics, you tend to see people get shiny object syndrome, right? And they want to go after what's the newest automation, what's the newest robotics, how can I put that into my operation? My operation needs that, right? Um, but as you hear from Mike, that's always not always the case. Um, so let's check out this clip from episode 32 um, with the CEO of Raymond Corporation, Mike Field. Um, so a lot of things that people do um, in terms of trying to uh, adjust or adapt and succeed in this newer climate, uh, this more fast-paced and higher demand climate, uh, is they quickly kind of lean to automation. Um, but Raymond is having this concept of optimizing before you automate. And I think for a lot of people in the industry, you know, there's a question of when should I automate or do I need automation to survive? And I think that the idea of optimizing before autom automation is something that some people are missing because so much automation is being pushed out and I guess put in front of them. I mean, if you look at Promat itself, I mean, everywhere you, you look, there's some type of automation or robotic that's out there. Um, so can you explain a little bit uh, about Raymond's idea of optimi optimization before autom automation and uh, what the concept is? Sure. Yeah, you know, the the concept is is really as you mentioned around all of the different possible automation solutions there are out there now. Many of them being offered by startup companies really are focused on the act of automating a process. Yeah. Um, you know, my experience is, as well as is our organization's experience on the on the manufacturing side is the process of making forklifts. You know, we learned a long time ago that uh, automating a bad process just makes you make bad things faster. So, um, you know, we, we, we really don't want to, um, to proliferate a, a bad process if you don't truly understand it and own it and understand the, the triggers or the, the key variables in, in that process. So really, our, our view is, is born to a degree of our lean management TPS uh, production system in our manufacturing facilities around really owning your process and really understanding it, working at uh, improving at continuous improvement, bringing in the, the tenants of, of lean management mm -hmm. to visualize your process. All of that requires data, which we happen to have with iWarehouse, and uh, really setting the stage for getting everyone uh, in the company involved in, in understanding the business at a very core level and then getting to root cause and starting to improve. Once you do that, then you can, you can make good decisions around you know, capital investments for automation around where the value is or where, which constraint you're trying to improve upon uh, to automate. So that you get the returns and the paybacks you know, that, that we're seeing now with, with our courier products and some of our automated solutions that are um, months, not multiple years uh, of return so that you really can um, manage your labor better or help, or help the associate work better 
with um, some aids within within a process rather than full automation. Definitely, definitely. I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of people think that they need to automate right away. But like you said, I, and I like what you said, where, you know, if you take a bad process and you automate it, you're just doing something bad faster, right? Um, but, you know, it may be something simple, like you mentioned, looking at it in a continuous improvement way. Um, you may be looking at automation when really maybe you just need to adjust the position of something within your facility and it may make a huge difference for you. So even with optimization, and I love, I love that clip actually because I love when he says that you're, if you're automating a bad process, you're just making the bad process faster. Uh, I think that's really key to the message of optimization before automation. But even with optimization, uh, without a doubt, I mean, automation is here to stay. It's inevitable, I think, uh, for most operations. At some point, in some level, some scale, there will be some operation. Um, but I think what's really interesting to see is how it's becoming more accessible and it's becoming adopted more and more uh, by an increasing amount of companies. Um, it's becoming more accessible, too, because more companies are coming in and providing different automation solutions at different price points, and you have like Locus, who are providing uh, robots as a service, which makes it a little more affordable than making a full capital um, investment into all the robots that you need. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, but with that being said, I mean, one of the biggest hurdles of acceptance of automation and robotics has been the debate over jobs, and that's jobs being taken by robots. And I think, you know, there's still that fear out there for the most part. Um, not for the most part. I mean, there's still the fear out there that's lingering, but I think it's dying down and a lot more people are seeing that maybe these robots are not going to just wipe out jobs completely um, and that maybe robots are needed uh, because there is such a high demand for workforce and more people uh, to work and, you know, we can't meet it at some point because sometimes these robots, they do these mundane tasks that people really don't want to take the job for. Um, and that's kind of the feedback that I was getting a lot from the ProMat floor. And then as I progressed through the year um, in multiple interviews, talking to a lot of different robotics companies in 2019, um, there was a few different views. So, I mean, I'd, I'd say there's like three different kind of views that I came across. So, you know, one being that there will be a dark warehouse with no humans at all. Um, and this one, I would say that I didn't interview anybody that truly believed that there would be a completely dark warehouse, or at least one in the near future. And, you know, most of the robotics companies believe that the key to robotics being successful is that they are collaborative robots or cobots and that they will work alongside humans. Uh, and I think that's really true, and I think what that's what we're seeing right now. I mean, the Locust Bot is a prime example. Um, we also talked to Six Rivers, does the same thing, um, and a couple of different companies as well um, that actually assist the, the worker, the human worker, um, assist them in doing their job more easily and more efficiently. And it actually helps them to without really knowing, it guides them to do the most efficient things that they can possibly do um, as humans. And then the robot takes care of kind of the mundane tasks and takes care of a lot of the transportation piece as well, um, which is something that can be straining on humans, um, you know, especially ergonomic wise, um, and a lot of walking and things of that nature. So, so it's actually a little safer as well when we touch on that part as well. Um, but the other thing that I think is really interesting, and I was really excited when uh, Ian Smith of Where actually brought this up in episode 36, um, because it's something that had been thrown around a little bit in other episodes, um, and in my personal discussions with other people in the industry throughout the year, uh, is that robots actually will end up elevating people's jobs, meaning that they will bring more important jobs um, to the surface and creating these new jobs for people to now fill. Uh, and from episode 36, when we talked to Ian Smith of Ware, um, he talks about an actual example of how that is playing out. 
And I think it's really, really interesting and a great way to see how that can actually happen. Um, it's on a little different scale because we're talking about drones instead of the robots that maybe you first think of when we're talking about warehousing or we're talking about like picking robots is the big deal. Um, but this is in regards to the drones and it's actually talking about how you're elevating uh, a position to someone that's like a drone uh, coordinator or supervisor. Um, so here's the clip. Check it out. Uh, you said something before, actually, which I think is pretty interesting because we've had a lot of uh, different robotics companies on uh, the show because robotics is becoming such a prevalent thing uh, within the warehousing space. And one of the, I guess, points of controversy all the time is, you know, that these robots are going to be taking people's jobs. Um, but there's also the philosophy that they're going to take these mundane tasks that people don't really want to do and then elevate people's positions and you mentioned about the uh the drone supervisor and i think that's like a perfect example to point out of how that kind of takes somebody that's probably maybe the cycle counter that was doing this counting before and now elevates their job a little more and gets them more involved with some technology that maybe they never would have touched before yeah you nailed it i mean that's that's exactly how we look at it that's yeah. how that's also how, like, so uh, I think it was Berkeley uh, just released, like, a few weeks ago, a study, like, literally analyzing automation in warehouses and how it's going to affect jobs. Okay. And the net net was that it's, it's so it's, it's taking over the task, but it's not replacing the job. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to create, in the short term, net new job growth to manage the machines to make sure everything's okay. And so the way that we see it, exactly how you mentioned you know, people will be doing cycle counting less. Like, yeah. first of all, nobody really wants to do cycle count. Like, they, the cycle counting is like a necessary <laughs> evil to have to do yeah. for a variety of It takes, it takes of a reasons. special person to enjoy doing inventory. I mean, and and granted, some people probably do really like it. And mm -hmm. like, you know, they want to have all, you know, I's dotted and T's crossed. And like that kind of person is probably great to yeah. just manage drone program and the robots that are mm -hmm. just, you know, operating in the warehouse. Um what we what we kind of see is, you know, along with that Berkeley study is obviously, yeah, like nobody wants to nobody wants to talk about it, nobody wants to say it. People need to cut costs. Like yeah. that's obvious. And there's better mm -hmm. ways to do things. Um, so what we see is more valuable than just looking around at inventory. I mean, first of all, it's you know very inefficient. It's mundane. It's dangerous getting up on those pickers sometimes to kind of look up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's inaccurate because like sometimes you can't even see far up, and you're using your brain to try to count and your eyes. And you know, there's so many little things that can go wrong. Um, so the more valuable things in the warehouses that we see and that what our customers get excited about are those people that were just walking around doing cycle counts can actually start doing things that warehouses do best. And it's like moving things around yeah. and like getting things out the door, getting things coming in mm -hmm. and just like increasing throughput and efficiency that way. So what do you think? You think that uh, you want to be a drone supervisor, a drone uh, coordinator or something like that in the warehouse? Uh, I think it's really interesting. Uh, definitely about, this job shift and I think it would be interesting too because you know one thing actually I'm thinking now that uh, was pointed out when I visited uh, Vecna Robotics was actually we talked about how and I think this was a really good point um, from them that they pointed out was that you know at some point these robots are going to come into a company and a company's not going to go out and hire a bunch of PhDs in robotics. Uh, so they're going to have to teach people within. So there's going to be new opportunity, I think, for people. And I think it's going to be opportunity for that warehouse worker that's on the floor that's actually going to be interacting with these. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see how that develops. Um, but even still, with jobs being changed, elevated, uh, or whatever the case may be, uh, there's still a large demand for workers in the warehouse, um, without a doubt. And I know from personal experience, uh, I'm operations manager currently still, uh, working in a warehouse. So I see it uh, where I'm at in New Jersey. I'm based in New Jersey. Uh, if you guys didn't know that. Um, but where I'm at based in New Jersey, there is so much competition it, between different warehouses to get workers and to get quality workers as well. Um, but as we saw when we spoke with Locust Robotics, um, when I did a visit up there, um, volume just continues to increase. Uh, more and more people are ordering things online. Uh, more and more people are fulfilling 
different orders from different warehouses. Uh, the number of warehouses just keeps increasing. The size of warehouses just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, it's crazy. Some of the size of these in my area, definitely. I mean, we're talking one and a half, two million square feet. Uh, crazy stuff. Um, huge. And so when we look at the volume and we see how it's increasing, uh, one of the things is how do we get the bodies in there and how do we get them not only in place because eh, you can put a body in place, but you know, if that body's not properly trained and is not doing the right thing, then are you really gaining value or you're just asking yourself for more mistakes or more issues? Um, so one thing that's really is really important is that you want to get those temporary new hires, seasonal workers in there during peak season, but you want them to be able to start up fast and you want them to be able to kind of pick up the pace and not have a huge downtime for training because in some cases maybe your peak season is like one month. So you got this person in and your training takes you know, a week to get them underway and then all of a sudden now you know, you're in peak season, but you don't have the time to dedicate to train these people. And you're kind of, I guess, flying by the seat of your pants a little bit. And, you know, it can get a little risky. So, and a lot of times you run into a debate. And I think I mentioned this on the show before where I had previous debate and previous job where do we actually spend the time to uh, get these temps set up on Ford's pit camp? And I would say yes, yes, because we want it to be right. Um, but the argument was always like, well, the time invested doesn't make sense because they're only going to be here for a little bit, maybe two weeks or something like that. But um, more often than not, when we put them in this certain area to pick a certain product um, that was a rush, we ended up getting more mistakes. So you kind of got a balance there, but companies are realizing that. And we just talked about it actually recently with uh, Zebra Technologies where you know, they're making platforms more user friendly and easier to grasp. Um, perfect example of that is the Locust Bot, without a doubt. Um, I used the Locust Bot myself twice this year. Uh, once at ProMan, I got a demo and then a private demo on site at um, Locust headquarters in Massachusetts. And it is just so easy to use. The platform is, it not only is it like easy to use the platform, but it's kind of fun too. Um, and I think that's really important because we look at now how people utilize uh, and interact with their smartphones, tablets, things of that nature. And I think Locus looked at that really, and they took that and put that on the picking machine. It's basically like an iPad on top of there, and it's just all touchscreen, and it makes total sense. You can walk up to it, and you can learn how to use it. I mean, in five minutes, you're picking with it without a doubt. Um, so it's really, really interesting to see, um, how things are evolving in that way. And I think it's super smart. Um, so this is from episode 38 from my Locust visit. Um, and Karen from Locust actually explains in the clip, uh, how they kind of handle peak season and how the ease of use is really there for them. So take a listen and then, uh, we'll wrap things up for this week. But one of the great things about the Locust bot you know, is the ease of use. And I can say for myself, I used it at Promat really quick. And to figure out how to use it, it was maybe like two minutes or something, and it was right away. Um, so now, can you talk about how easily that can go into place, and especially during peak season when we talk about hiring and distribution centers, fulfillment centers are bringing on more and more employees and having to get them up and running with their picking operation even faster than normal? Sure. Uh, you know, as we discussed back in, in April, our business model is robots as a service. Okay. So that just when people, when people hire our robots, they're, they're essentially paying the robot a monthly wage. We don't, mm. they don't, they don't buy the robots out, right? Mm. They subscribe to the robots. Okay. And sort of like paying the robot a paycheck. And what's, what that model enables is for our customers to scale up and scale down the robot population okay. as their as their seasonal volume changes mm -hmm. so it's it's really kind of like getting flexibility as a service That's great. this this time of year our customers 
are hiring lots of temp workers mm -hmm. and bringing them to warehouse, as you said, and yeah. a lot of those workers are just unfamiliar with the warehouse operation. Uh, in the past, that would have required a lot of training, not just to train the worker about the layout of the warehouse itself and where everything was located, yeah. but also to train them on their picking processes. Yeah. Well, now they still hire some temp workers, but they're hiring temp robots at the same time. Okay. We will increase our customers' robot populations by as much as 50% this time of year. Mm. And what's great is when the robots come in, it's so easy for the workers to use them. The workers don't even have to learn about the layout of the entire warehouse. Yeah. They can stay in a zone, and then the robot is going to bring the work to them. Yeah. So, so when they encounter, yep, section. exactly. So you, you don't have to learn everything where everything is in the warehouse, just, just your zone and the break room. And then when the robot brings its work to you, you basically just do whatever the robot tells you. Yeah. Uh, the robot's always going to be directing the worker's work. Okay. so that the worker doesn't really have to spend too much time thinking, oh, where do I go next, or what do I mm -hmm. do now? Robot shows up, it gives instructions, the worker makes the pick into the robot, and the robot moves on, and the worker moves to the next robot. So really, really uh, interesting stuff, and making it so easy is the key, I think, to really being able to achieve those high-demand service levels. Just make it easy and simple. And some of the companies I talked to this year, I mean, they really get that and they really are making things a lot simpler and easier. Um, also, I wanted to mention, too, I know in the Locust visit that uh, we had put out there that you should go on LinkedIn, say how many units you think will be picked during Cyber Week by Locust bots. Um, and Locust posted uh, that it actually came in at 5 million plus units for Cyber Week. So that's huge. Um, and I think they saw the number of picks year over year was at uh, 400% from 2018. So so congratulations to them, definitely. Um, I think even they doubled business since I had spoke to them at ProMat originally in just a couple months. So uh, I think they're really on fire and they're really going to be um, pushing through. And I'm actually, I'll am actually i actually be um, at NRF uh, next week as well. So if you guys are going to be at NRF, definitely reach out uh, and let me know. I'll be there on Sunday only. Um, but I will talk to our friends uh, from Zebra Technologies while I'm there. Um, check out the Locust booth and check out some others as well. Going to be connecting with uh, Manhattan Associates as well. Uh, we're going to have some upcoming podcast episodes with them potentially. And a lot of exciting stuff coming, from, uh, coming for 2020. Uh, so definitely 2019, uh, it was... It was exciting. I mean, I will say I never uh, expected the podcast to really take off like this, and I'm happy that uh, it's providing some value to people out there. Um, so I'd love to hear from you and hear your thoughts on the podcast. Um, so you can leave a review. Remember, we're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we're on Google Music. Uh, and, of course, you can go to thenewwarehouse.com, and there is a blog post that goes with every episode giving more information. Uh, and you can leave a comment there, or you can email me personally, kevin at thenewwarehouse.com. That's kevin at thenewwarehouse.com. Uh, if you're interested in being on the show, you have an interesting topic you want to discuss, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, in 2020, I will be looking to hopefully expand and get some video content going for you guys. Uh, maybe adding a new series of episodes, maybe having two episodes a week instead of just the one on Mondays. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I definitely want to provide more value, and I think there's a lot of other things that we can do with this, um, so I'm getting excited for that. Uh, and, of course, the big thing right now is Modex coming up in March. That's Modex 2020 in Atlanta. Uh, I will be there. The new warehouse will be there. We will have a booth on the floor. I'm really, really excited about this because uh, at Promat, uh, if you saw me there, maybe not because at that point, I think I was just kind of coming out. The new warehouse was brand new. Um, but I think a lot of listeners came out of Promat as well. Um, so I appreciate you definitely for listening and subscribing. Um, but I was just running around with a handheld mic microphone for three days um so we're actually going to have like a a studio set up in a booth at modex on the floor uh so it's going to be a lot of fun 
Um, hopefully some of our previous guests on the show will do some kind of uh, cool partnerships with them in the booth. Uh, so that'll all be a surprise once we get there. Um, so if you're going to go to Modex or you're thinking about go to Mo- going to Modex, definitely do it. Um, go to Modex, you're going to see a lot of awesome things, um, and you can definitely stop by the New Warehouse uh, podcast stu- uh, studio on the floor. Um, so definitely more information about that will be coming out. Uh, if you guys are not signed up for the email list, head to the newwarehouse.com, get on the email list, and you can get more information about the New Warehouse um, every Monday morning. We send an email uh, with information about the show and other things that are happening as well. And if you are not following us on social media yet, make sure you do that. We are on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, go on there, follow the new warehouse, just search for the new warehouse. Um, you can also find the links to those social media pages on the new warehouse.com. Um, so thank you guys so much for 2019 being listeners, being subscribers, and I hope that I can continue to bring you value uh, throughout 2020 and beyond. Um, If you are interested in getting involved in the New Warehouse, just reach out uh, through the newwarehouse.com. If you want to be a guest or anything of that nature, I'm happy to hear your feedback. If you are enjoying the show, uh, please definitely uh, give us a rating and give us a follow on all these social channels. Um, So here's to 2020. Have a great year and thank you for last year. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from the new warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for the new warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.